Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing grace and for your love and for your presence here with us, Father. Even as I prayed this morning, Lord, there's no need for us to even be here if you're not going to be here with us. It would all be in vain. There's no power in my words. I can't save anyone. I can. I cannot transform anyone's life. Only you can. And I know that I'm not worthy of your salvation, nor am I worthy to be called as a pastor. But I'm thankful that you have saved me and that you have called me. And I'm thankful that you have blessed me this morning with the opportunity to preach your word. And I pray that we would receive it as the word of God and not as the word of man. And I pray for our hearts to be receptive, for your spirit is here with us. And we want to thank you for that. And now I pray that we would be humble, especially those of us who are men. I pray that we would be humble and that we would resist all forms of pride and arrogance and that we would leave here knowing that we've heard from the Lord and with the determination in our heart to be obedient to the things that we've heard. And I ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Mark's account of the gospel, Mark chapter 4. I started a series, and I want to tell you something. I've really enjoyed this series, and I've heard a lot of feedback from, from, uh, from several of you how much you've enjoyed this series. But I started a series a few weeks ago out of, the, out of Mark's account of the gospel entitled Living to Serve Like Jesus. And really, it's a series on servanthood. I mean, Christ is our example. Jesus Christ came as a servant. And he has saved us so that we, in turn, would be servants. And so, once again, we're carrying on with that theme this morning. And I want to ask you the question. I want to begin by asking you the question, especially those of us who are men, those of us who are fathers. Are you a servant father? Are you a servant father? Now, some of you may be tempted to check out right now. Some of you may be tempted to check out because you're a woman. And you would say, well, this is not a sermon that's meant for ladies. It's a, he's talking to fathers this morning. I want you to know that I will be addressing fathers. But the principles that you are going to learn this morning apply to you as well. They apply to mothers. They apply to women. Others of you may say, well, I'm a little boy or I'm a teenager and uh, I'm not even married yet and I'm not a father well I want you to know that these are principles that you need to learn now you need to learn now and there's no excuse some of us might be tempted to say well I can't live that way because of my own father my own father wasn't this type of man and so it's very difficult for me to be this type of man and so um, and so you want to blame your father uh, and you use that for, as your excuse for not being a servant father. Hey, that's lame. Okay, can I just tell you that? That, 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 that is not, that, that's lame. That's weak. And the reason I can say that is because my father was not a, what I would consider a servant father, a spiritual man. And, but yet I'm seeking to be a servant father and to be a spiritual man in spite of the way I was raised, okay? So uh, I can speak to the issue because I've been there. So don't whine, right? Just gird up your loins, listen to what the Word of God says, and leave here with the determination to be the type of man that God wants you to be. All right? Amen. Well, our passage today is going to be in Mark chapter 4, verse 1. I, I, you know, Father's Day, I, 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 it's a little different. For, you know, we preach on, when pastors preach on Mother's Day, it's usually a very encouraging type message. 
you know, it's Mama's Day. We want, we want Mama to leave church feeling good. But it's kind of the opposite on Father's Day. We just, pastors just unload on you, don't we? I mean, it's just like, we just, and you leave here feeling like, oh my goodness, my, uh, well, I, I don't know how you'll feel leaving here today, but I do have your best interest at heart. I want you to notice that. So, so Mark chapter four, verse one, Jesus said, or the word of God says, again, he began to teach by the sea and a very large crowd gathered around him. So he got into a boat on the sea and he sat down. And while the whole crowd was on the shore facing the sea, he taught them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, consider the sower who went out to sow. And as he sowed, this occurred. Some seed fell upon the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up right away since it didn't have much depth. And when the sun came up, it was scorched, and since it didn't have a root, it withered. Others fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it out, and it didn't produce a crop. Still others fell on good ground and produced a crop that increased 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. Then he said, anyone who has ears to hear should listen. And when he was alone with his twelve, those who were around him asked him about the parable. He answered them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those outside everything comes in parables, so that uh, th they may look and look yet not perceive, and they may listen and listen yet not understand, otherwise they might turn back and be forgiven. Then he said to them, Don't you understand the parable? How then will you understand any of the parables? The sower that sows the word these are the ones along the path where the word is sown and when they hear immediately satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them and these are the ones sown on the rocky ground when they hear the word immediately they receive it with joy but they have no root in themselves they are short-lived when pressure or persecution comes because of the word, they immediately stumble. Others are sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word. But the worries of this age, the seduction of wealth, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But the ones sown on the good ground are those who hear the word. They welcome it. They produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some a hundred times what was sown. You say, Pastor, how in the world are you going to preach a message on fathers from that passage of Scripture? Well, I understand that this passage of Scripture does not specifically address fathers. Jesus is teaching Christians in general. As a matter of fact, he's preparing them for the coming kingdom. And he's reminding them of, he's reminding specifically his twelve of the type of people they're going to encounter as they go out preaching the gospel. Basically, he's saying this. You are the sowers, and as you go out, and Jesus is one of the sowers, the seed is what? The seed is the Word of God, and the different soils represent people, specifically the hearts of people. So Jesus is telling his disciples this, and the other multitudes that are there listening, he's telling them this. During this kingdom age, you're going to encounter all kinds of people when you go out sharing the word, when you go out preaching the gospel. Some of the people that you encounter, they're going to have a hard heart, like the seed that fell upon the path and the birds came and they snatched it away. We'll talk about that one in a moment. He said other people are going to be like seed that falls among the, the rocks they receive the word, but it's not very deep. They're shallow. There's no commitment there. Some people are going to be like that. He says other people are going to be like the seed that falls upon the, the thorns and the thistles. And as it begins to grow, the thorns and the thistles, they choke it out. He says these are double-minded people. These are worldly people. Their, their profession of faith is shallow. The other one, their profession of faith is double-minded. They're worldly. 
They want to have their feet in, in two different things, in Christ and, and in the world. He said some people will be like that. He says, but then there are those who receive the word and they obey the word and they bear fruit for the kingdom. He says, these are those who have a good, their heart has been prepared. They are the good soil, those who are genuinely saved. So some people are going to have stony hearts. Some people are going to have shallow hearts. Some people are going to have strangled hearts. But then others are going to have saved hearts. So Jesus is really talking about the different kinds of people and the way some people will reject the word and how other people will, other people will, will receive the word. I'm going to draw some spiritual principles from this passage of Scripture today, three specifically. And I believe that the spiritual principles that I draw from this passage of Scripture need to be applied to the life of every father. Okay? Now, I want to set the stage just for a moment by sharing with you an illustration. Near the end of World War II, a plane carrying 24 members of the U.S. military crashed in, New, in the New Guinea jungle. They were on a sightseeing excursion. Three of the people in the crash survived. They were able to get word out. However, they were badly injured, gangrene had already begun to set in, and there wasn't much they could do to save themselves. There was a man in the military, a, a part of the special forces, who was assigned the responsibility of putting together a force of 10 specialized volunteers. Their responsibility was to fly, parachute into the jungle and seek to rescue these three other soldiers who were badly injured. The man assigned to the task was C. Earl Walter Jr. He was a part of a special recon team and their motto was, come what may. As he assembled his 10 volunteers, he told them this. First, he told them that they were jumping into an unknown place on the map. They would have nothing but their wits and compass to guide them. That was the first thing he warned them of. The second warning, the jungle is going to be thick. It is going to be the worst possible drop zone ever. Third warning, if we survive the jump, which is highly unlikely, it's a very good possibility that we may be attacked by the natives who are known to be cannibals. The last warning was the worst. He said, no one, no one had a plan of being able to rescue them if the mission failed. They would have to walk 150 miles to the north or to the south to the coast. By the way, carrying three other men who were severely injured. If they chose to go the north route, which was probably the best route, they would have to go through the cannibalistic tribes. If they went south, there was a possibility that they would encounter the Japanese force. What were these volunteers going to do? I can tell you this, their leader, Mr. Walters, was willing to go. And he was willing to lead by example. He was willing to lay his life down as a sacrifice in order to rescue those who needed him. Now, much can be said about the same about Jesus Christ. That's exactly what Jesus Christ came to do. The Bible teaches us that man, Christ, without sin, has fallen, in, has fallen into their own depravity. 
And because of our sinful depravity, we deserve death. There's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. When Jesus Christ looked down from heaven to earth, you know what he saw? He saw us helpless. He saw us weak. He saw us as ungodly. He saw us as enemies of God. Then by, motivated by his own sovereign grace, he chose to leave the glories of heaven, parachute out of heaven, if you will, into a dangerous land, clothing himself with humanity. And Jesus Christ came and he went to the cross and he died in your place and he died in my place so that we might be saved. And we know that what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross was enough because three days later he rose from the dead, thus giving proof that the wrath of God has been satisfied. And for those who trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, those who surrender their lives to him, the Bible says there is no longer any condemnation for those that are in Christ. Hallelujah and praise the Lord for our heavenly Father who has given us so great a salvation. As we look in today's passage of Scripture, what we see is we see large crowds that are beginning to gather around Jesus. And Jesus begins to distance himself from the crowd. As a matter of fact, he's not able to carry out his ministry as he normally would. Normally he would walk among the people talking to the people and touching the people and healing the people. But the crowds had grown to such an extent that Jesus can't preach in the, in the normal way. So you know what he has to do? He has to get in a boat and push away from shore. So he won't be crushed and crowded by all the people. And as Jesus pushes away from the shore, he begins to address the multitude. But specifically, what Jesus was teaching was not necessarily for the multitude as much as it was for his 12 disciples. So Jesus pushes away from the shore, and he begins to teach his disciples about the kingdom and what's going to characterize the kingdom. So we see Jesus preaching this kingdom message. He said, and he used a common analogy that they would all understand. The analogy of a sower, a farmer, a farmer who goes out to sow seed. He said, think, if you will, of a sower. And as a sower is on his way to sow seed in his field, some of the seed falls upon the path. Falls upon the path. But the path is hard. The path is hard. The soil on the path is hard. Why? Because it's been walked on so much. And the seed is not able to penetrate into the soil because of the hardness of the path. And so the seed lays there exposed. And as the seed is exposed, the birds of the air, they come and they snatch the seed away. Jesus says, this represents a person with a hard heart. In other words, there are going to be people who you share the word of God with and they are going to be indifferent to it. They've got stony hearts. They've got hard hearts. They just don't care. I got a feeling that there may be some stony hearts in here with us today. As I preach the word of God and as I share these things, there are some people here today who are just absolutely indifferent to what they're hearing. They've got a hard heart. And as the word of God is being sown into your life, it's unable to penetrate your stony heart. And then the enemy's going to come, and before you know it, he's going to take the seed away. And you're going to forget what you've heard and not even really care about what you heard. And he said some people are going to be like that. He says other people are going to have shallow hearts. The Bible says that they receive it with, with joy. If you look there, look at verse 13. He says, verse 14, look at chapter 4, verse 14. He says, the sowers sow the word. These are the ones along the path where the word is sown. And when they hear it, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word. That's the hard heart. Verse 16, and these are the ones sown on the rocky ground, 
When they hear the word, immediately, notice what he says, immediately they receive it with what? They receive it with joy. But go on and read. If we stop there, we would say, well, that's a saved person. However, go on and read. Verse 17. But they have no what? They have no root in themselves. They are short-lived, and when pressure or persecution comes, becomes of the word, they immediately stumble. Or some Bible translations say, they immediately fall away. This is not talking about someone who is once saved and then they lose their salvation. That's not what this passage is talking about at all. This is talking about a person who hears the word of God and they receive the word of God. They want what's easy. And so they make an emotional, shallow profession of faith, but it doesn't take root in their heart because there's no depth in their commitment. Have you ever known a person like that? Maybe there are some people here today who have shallow hearts. You've made a profession of faith. You've made a profession of faith. You've walked an aisle. You've been baptized. But you're not serving God. You're not following God. As a matter of fact, if you look at your life, your life says you really don't even care about the things of God. You know why? It's because you've got a shallow heart. What that means is that there's no depth in your commitment. You wanted easy salvation. You wanted Jesus to save you from your sin, but you don't want him to be the Lord of your life. And that's not biblical salvation at all. Someone with a stony heart, someone with a hard heart is lost. But let me tell you, friend, someone with a shallow heart is also lost. You may have received the word with joy, but if there is no depth in your commitment, which will be made manifest by the way you live your life, if there is no depth in your commitment, then your heart is shallow and your salvation is false. Jesus says, but then there's also those who have a strangled heart. Look at Verse 18, he says, others are sown among the thorns. These are the, word, these are the ones who hear the word, but listen. But the worries of this age, the seduction of wealth, and the desires for things enter in, and they choke the word, and it becomes what? It becomes unfruitful. This is a strangled heart. These are those, the type of people who want it their way. They want to come to God on their terms, not his. They make a profession of faith. There's a measure of concern in their life, but they're double-minded. Double-minded. Yes, they've received the word. Yes, they've made a profession of faith. But if you look at their life, they try to have their feet in, 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 in the world, and they try to have their feet in Christianity. You ever know anybody like that? Boy, for a, few, for a few weeks or so or for a month, you'll see them just de seemingly dedicated to the Lord. Man, they're coming to church and they're doing all the right things. But then months will go by and you don't even see the person. Don't even see them. And you hear about they're doing this, they're doing that. They're back to their old way of life. They're back to doing the things that they used to do. And then what, four months later, here they come, go, here they come again. They're all gung-ho again. And they're gung-ho for about what? Two weeks? Three weeks? Maybe a month? Maybe two months? Two months go by, then what happens? You hear, where's old so-and-so? Oh, don't you know he's back to doing what he used to do? She's back to doing what she used to, do, used to do. Back in the world again. Back out there doing those things. Listen, that's a strangled heart. That's a double-minded person. Jesus said you can't love the world and have the love of God at the same time. Jesus says, if you're not willing to forsake all and follow me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. Isn't that what the Bible says? Hear me now. I say this in love. Someone with a, with a, stony, a stony heart, a hard heart, we all would agree that person's not saved. Why? Because they're indifferent to the word. They don't receive the word. But, then the, but what about those who have a shallow heart? What about those who profess faith in Jesus with joy but as soon as they're faced with the high cost of following Jesus in other words it's not easy being a Christian right 
as soon as they're faced with the high cost of following Jesus. You mean I can't do this sinful thing anymore? Nope, you need to repent of that. Nah, I don't want to repent. I like it too much. I thought this Christian stuff was going to be easy. I didn't know it, was, I didn't know it meant that I had to serve God. And so because of the high cost that's placed on them, because of that calling of servanthood, you know what they do? They forsake their profession and they go back to what? They go back to what they're used to. That's a shallow heart. That is a person who may make a profession with their lips, but there's no commitment in their heart. That person is lost. And then there's the person, well, we have to be very careful because this truly characterizes the Christianity of our day, which is really not biblical Christianity at all. And it's the strangled heart. It's the worldly person. The person who makes a profession of faith in Jesus with joy, but yet, man, they're worldly. They're living two different lives. They've got their Christian mask that they put on, and then they've got their true face. Hey, and sometimes we can be real good Man, I was a worldly person for a long time. The whole time I dated my wife, every Sunday, you know what I'd do? Every Sunday, I'd put my Christian mask on, and I would go to, I'd go to church with my wife, or my, she was my girlfriend at that time, Kelly, and her parents. Isn't it nice that our daughter's dating a Christian man who will go to church with us? As soon as church was over, Let's party up. Let's get it on. Right? Let's live like the world. Look like the world. Think like the world. Oh, it's what day is it? It's Saturday night. Sunday. Oh, I'm gonna, oh I better. Where's my mask at? Where did I put that? Oh, there it is. Sunday morning. Okay. Got my mask on. Strangled heart. Worldly. Lost lost unsaved the only person that's saved in this parable is the fourth soil you say pastor why do you say that because it's the only one that bore fruit what does Jesus tell us about a true Christian you'll know them by their what their fruit now uh, granted not everybody's going to bear the same amount of food, fruit some bear 60, some 30, some 100. We, we, our lives aren't going to look the same, but make no mistake about it. A person who is genuinely saved, you'll know them because of the life that they live, the values they have. Now, now I want to start bringing it home to fathers. Are you a servant father? You remember I asked that question? Here's, a, here, here's how you know what, who a servant father is. A servant father, number one, is willing to evaluate his own salvation. That's what a servant father does. Am I really saved? Is it biblical to ask that question? Absolutely. 2 Corinthians 13 tells us to examine. Our, Paul says, examine yourself, see whether or not you're in the faith, or unless you fail the test. It's biblical to evaluate your salvation. It's biblical to examine yourself. So fathers, are you a servant father? A servant father is willing to evaluate his salvation or his profession of faith. So which one are you? Are you humble enough to evaluate your life right now and be honest? Are you a stony-hearted father in, in, as it relates to the Word of God? Are you a shallow-hearted father as it relates to the Word of God? Are you a strangled-hearted father? Or can you really say, I've got a saved heart and I'm a servant of the Lord? Oh, a servant father is willing to evaluate his profession of faith. Is it true? Is it sincere? Have I genuinely been saved? You know why it's so important for you to answer that question, to ask that question, to answer that question? 
because you have a responsibility. You have children, you have a responsibility to raise them up in the way they should go, to teach them the things of God. You want your children to be saved? I don't think there's a father in here who would raise his hand and say, you know, I don't care whether my child goes to heaven or hell. I don't care. I think every father in here would say, I hope that my boy, I hope that my daughter grows up to know the Lord because I want her to go to heaven one day and to be with Jesus. You know where it begins? It begins with you preparing her heart. It begins with you preparing his heart. To receive the word. How do you prepare your child's heart to be saved? How do you prepare your child's heart to receive the word? By first evaluating your own profession of faith and making sure that you are genuinely saved. <clears throat> Number two. A servant father not only is willing to evaluate his own heart, a servant father is willing to teach his children the truth. A servant father is willing to teach his children the truth. The truth, the truth found in the Word. Isn't that what we see? Jesus, Jesus is our example of servanthood, correct? What do we see Jesus doing in this passage? We see Jesus teaching his disciples, those who are entrusted to him. What's he doing? He's teaching them truth. I think it's great when fathers teach their children how to shoot a basketball or hit a golf ball or, or to swing a bat or to play tennis or whatever it may be. Or, or a father who teaches his daughter how to dance. I mean, those things are wonderful. And bless you, Father, for doing those things and for being at your children's sporting events and supporting them. Bless you. Praise the Lord for you. But listen, your greatest task and your greatest responsibility is to teach your children the truth of God's Word. You understand that? In the day that we live in, this has always been true. It has always been expected of us. It has always been a, a essential and a necessity, and it ought to be a priority. But how much more so in this moral, anemic society that we live in, that we teach them truth. Truth is being perverted in our day. Media say, says that the truth is this, and and. Polit many politicians say that the truth is liberal politicians who say that the truth is this. But we need fathers who are willing to stand up and say, listen, child, I know what that person may say. I know what may be popular in our society. I know what this state may have voted on. I know what the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court may say. But listen, this is what the Word of God says about the issue. Therefore, we stand upon the Word of God. And come what may, wasn't that the theme of the, the recon soldiers I told you about a few moments ago? What was their theme? Come what may. We do what we're supposed to do, what we've been called to do and trained to do, and come what may. Listen. We do what we're supposed to do, what we've been called to do. We uphold the truth of God's word, and listen, and come what may. We need fathers who are willing to teach their children the truth. You know why you need to teach them the truth? Because of the aggression of Satan. Part of the armor of God is what? The belt of truth. The belt of truth means that everything about your child's life, everything about who your child is, should be girded up with truth. It's truth that will enable your child to stand against the schemes of the devil. If your child does not know truth, and if your child does not see you standing for truth, then they will become easy prey for the enemy. So listen to me, fathers. It is, it is 
essential. It is urgent that you stand for truth, learn the truth, teach the truth to your children because of the aggression of our enemy. It's also important for you to teach your children truth because of the coming age. Persecution is already happening all around the world today. But listen, persecution is knocking at the door of America. And there are spots of persecution here and there as we found out this week in Charleston. But it will, it will not be long when persecution will become the norm in America. And the coming persecution demands that your children know truth. Also, the deceitfulness of their own flesh demands that you teach them truth. Oh, I, I need to know truth. You know why? Because my flesh is deceitful. What about yours? I put no confidence in Blake. My flesh is deceitful. Guess what? So is the flesh of my children. The only thing, hear me now, the only thing that keeps me from giving in to the desires of my own sinful flesh is the truth of God's word. Therefore, the only thing that's going to keep my children from giving in to the desires of their own flesh is for them to be girded up with the truth of God's word. Servant fathers, teach your children truth and I shouldn't have to tell the mothers today if father's absent you should already be applying this to your life right <laughs> lastly servant fathers lead their children by example Servant fathers lead their children by example. Jesus told his disciples that a truly saved person is what? One who receives the word and bears fruit. And Jesus set the example for what that looked like, didn't he? He set the example. Jesus says, listen, you need to evaluate your own salvation. That's what a servant father does. Which heart, which heart, is, which heart is yours? The second thing, a servant father teaches, by, teaches their children just as Jesus taught his disciples the truth. And lastly, a servant father leads their children by example. Oh, listen, you can't stand before your children and berate them and say, this is what the Bible says, this is what the Bible says, this is what the Bible says, and then for you to go out and live differently? That's ignorant. You know why that's ignorant? Because much of what we teach our children is more caught than it is taught. They're going to watch what you do. They're going to watch what you say. Make no mistake about it. They are watching how you treat their mother. They are watching how you respond to pressure. They are watching how you live your life. And you may tell them all day long that this is what the Bible says, but they're going to be watching to see whether or not it's true by whether or not you obey it. Servant fathers lead their children by example. I think every father in here today would say, I want my child to have a what? A servant's heart. I want the heart of my child to be the good soil. Then don't be indifferent. Don't have a shallow commitment. Don't be worldly. If you don't want them to be indifferent, then don't you. If you don't want them to be shallow, then don't you. If you don't want them to be worldly, then don't you.
you want them to be servants? Then you be a servant father of the king servant, Jesus. Your children need you to love God. They need you to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Your children need you to love God. Your children need you to love their mother. You say, Mom, their mother and I are no longer together. I understand. I came from a divorced home. I get that. So they may not be able to observe you loving their mother, but they can observe your love. So they need to see your love for God, your love for others. They need to see your love for them. And true love is not only teaching spiritual truth, but modeling spiritual truth. With the same attitude and character as that of Jesus. When Walter finished his litany of warnings to his soldiers, he waited. He gave them time to think. And then he asked for volunteers. And everyone, every member of the recon team raised their hand and was willing to go. I stand before you men today as Mr. Walters. And I say that the task ahead of us is not easy. There's warnings. Our enemy is very aggressive. He prowls around like a lion and he wants to destroy. That's the first warning. Second warning is that there's everything that's trying to grab for our the attention of those that we're supposed to be helping. We're going to be there to help them, but they're going to be distracted by the Internet and by Facebook and Instagram. They're going to be distracted by all the things of the world. And their hearts are deceitfully wicked above all things. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard. But I'm willing to go. Who's willing to go? Raise your hand, man. I'm asking for volunteers today. I'm asking for volunteers. I'm talking about servant fathers. Where are they at? Keep those hands up. Where are they at? All around the auditorium. All right. You've raised your hand. You've volunteered for the mission. You've been called by Christ. Let us leave here today, men, with the determination to be the type of fathers that Christ has called us to be. Amen. I want to ask if you would to pray with me. I started this sermon off by asking the question, are you a servant father? And what that means is this, is first of all, you need to evaluate your heart and so Dear sir, are you saved? Are you saved? Do you truly have a saved heart, a servant's heart? Can you say without a shadow of a doubt that if you were to die today, you would be with Jesus because you know you're saved? I believe that there are some men in here today who can't say that. You've had a stony heart. You've had a shallow heart. You've had a strangled heart. And you've been putting on the mask year after year, week after week. And this morning is your day. This is a day of humility for you. A day for you to be honest with yourself. And it's not just for the men, but for the ladies and for the, the others that are here today. It's for you. You need to be saved. 
here in a moment I'm going to ask everybody to stand we're going to have pastors standing down front and here in a moment when I ask you to stand I want you to come forward it's going to take courage I know that I'm going to ask you to stand and for those of you who need to be saved I want you to step out from where you are and I want you to walk up to one of these pastors and I want you to walk up to them and say I'm coming today to get my life right with Jesus I'm tired of putting it off. I'm tired of wearing the mask. I'm tired of playing games. I'm coming today to nail it down, to get my relationship with Christ right. I'm coming to surrender my life to Him. I'm coming to be saved. When I ask you to stand, you're going to come. Walk up to one of these pastors. Others of you here this morning, you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved, but man, I need to do a better job of being a servant father. I've kind of dropped the ball here lately. I've allowed other things to to distract me. And I haven't been teaching my children the truth like I should. And I haven't been setting the example as I should. And my, my fruit's been about 30-fold, but I want it to be 60. <laughs> I want to bear more fruit for the Lord. And So maybe you just want to come and kneel at the altar and just pray. Pray for strength and pray for grace. And would you just come here in a moment and do that? Just bow at the altar and pray. Maybe others of you, the Lord's leading you to join this church. You want to come and join this morning. Others of you, maybe the Lord has a special call on your life to some type of ministry, and you want to come and make that known. Right now, I'm going to ask you to stand, and I want you to respond as the, as the Lord leads. Would you, would you come? Let's stand, and right now you come. Begin to make your way forward. If you need to be saved, don't hesitate. That's what we're here for. You come. Begin to make your way to the soul. Let's go.